I called it Linux originally as a working name. And and that was just because Linus and the X has to be there. It's Unix. I mean it's it's like a law. And and what happened was that I initially thought that I can't call it Linux publicly because it's just too egotistical. And that was before I had a big ego, right? They thought they were taking a whole bunch of components and putting them around Linux. So they ended up calling the whole thing a Linux system, and somehow that term caught on. And the result is there are now 10 million people using this variant of the GNU system, the GNU slash Linux operating system, and most of them don't know it. So, some people advocate that it be described as GNU slash Linux. I mean, what's your thought on that? Is that justified? or? Well, I think it's justified, but it's justified if you actually make a GNU distribution of Linux. The same way that I think that Red Hat Linux is fine, or SUSE Linux, or Debian Linux. Uh, because if you actually make your own distribution of Linux, you get to name the thing. But calling Linux in general GNU Linux, I think, is just ridiculous. I got involved in Fall 93 because I was sent a copy of the first CD-ROM commercial Linux distribution, which was called Yggdrasil. It was produced by Adam Richter. And I got a copy because I had been myself writing free software for a long time, since the early 80s. I was actually one of the early GNU contributors myself. And I was absolutely astonished. I was completely astonished because I'd been a software engineer for nearly 15 years at that point. And according to all the rules I, I knew about controlling complexity, keeping your project group small, having closely managed ob objectives, Linux should have been a disaster, and it wasn't. Instead, it was something wonderful and I was determined to figure out how they were getting away with that. In order for Linux to grow beyond the world of the computer programmer, it needed a use, an application, that made it a must-have technology. That threshold was crossed with the development of a program that made complex websites possible. That program is the Apache Web Server. The killer app of Linux was undoubtedly the Apache Web Server. If you look at the history of Linux, the adoption curve of Linux and the adoption curve of the Internet exactly track each other. 1993, which was when the Apache Web Server project really got started, was also the beginnings of the popular ISP explosion, when the Internet first became a mass market commodity, and the idea of web-based electronic commerce and, and mass communication became real. I think it was one of the first applications that caused people to go, wow, if, if I install Linux, I get some tangible benefit from doing so, right? I mean, clearly there were a lot of interesting applications on Linux at, at, at the time, this being maybe two or three years ago when this re thing really started to take off. But there wasn't a, comp a driving, you know, you could almost say business case for someone to use Linux versus using NT until, I think, Apache. And, and a lot of the things that plugged into Apache and, and, and enhanced Apache. I mean, when you went to go out, build, uh, go out and build a server farm, it was much more cost effective, cost effective, real dollar terms, to build it on Linux and Apache than it was to build it on IIS and NT. Even if it meant that you had to spend a little bit of money to train your staff to learn how to use that or to find people who were knowledgeable. But the good news was that that knowledge wasn't very expensive because there were all these college students out there who had been using Linux for a long time and, and were very familiar with it. If you look at the trend curves in web servers, Apache has steadily been gaining in market share ever since. It's up to something like 66% now. It's steadily clobbered all of the closed source competition. And that's because it's more reliable, it's more flexible, it's more extensible. It does what webmasters actually need. And the combination of Apache and Linux found its way into a great many commercial shops. Essentially, Apache became the application that motivated internet service providers and e-commerce companies to choose Linux over Microsoft's Windows. It would probably run best on Linux and on FreeBSD, and the reason is the communities around those operating systems are also the communities that contribute the most back to Apache, right? Uh, and they were also the operating systems that internet service providers started using very heavily as well. Um, and internet service providers really liked Apache because it allowed them to do a lot of different things that some of the commercial web servers didn't, such as the ability to host more than one website on a single box, which clearly if you're an ISP and you have 40,000 users and they all want their own website is going to be pretty important to you.
One of the key factors in the growth of Linux was the creation of companies that specialized in the distribution and support of the operating system itself. Among these companies, Red Hat Software is the best known. Red Hat started as the product of uh, Mark Ewing. While he was working at IBM, he wanted a, a little better Linux distribution. He started playing around. Found out he, uh, he he spent more time maintaining his Linux distribution than he did uh, than he did working on his new project. So he, uh, he he sort of started the distribution itself. He met up with Bob Young, who at the time was running a company called ACC Bookstore, which was a mail order PC Unix uh, catalog. And Bob kind of knew he wanted something you know more his own to market rather than reselling other people's products. And and he was fairly good at marketing. And and Mark uh, Mark knew he needed some marketing help because he was fairly good at the technical part, so they kind of got together. I started working with Red Hat in May of 1995, basically right out of NC State, along with uh, Eric Trowan, who me and him combined make up employees number four and five. Um, and we actually reported to work at an apartment that uh, Mark Ewing used to live in. Um, we took it over as kind of the development part of Red Hat software uh, and stayed that way till about November of 1995 when, uh, when a toilet we had in the apartment kind of exploded, flooded our downstairs neighbor and she got a little upset and, uh, and, and the apartment folks found out we were running a business there instead of actually living there at the same time. So they decided to throw us out. So at that point we had about a week to go find uh, our first office, which we did, and get ourselves moved uh, in a hurry. So. We started going in, again, 95 or so to the venture capital firms, asking, saying, there's something happening here. There's a great business opportunity to build the next sun for open source. Well, the venture capitalists looked at this and said, gee, it's, you're selling systems, uh, the software's free, this is kind of scary. We're not sure that we want to want to put money in. And by the way, we we funded other systems companies, and and it hasn't really hasn't really panned out. We're scared. I came to the U.S. about three years ago, and the reason really was that I'd been spending like six or seven years at Helsinki University, and decided that it was time to see the real world and not just university life. Especially this area had a lot of the most interesting work being done. So I just decided that let's try to move halfway across the, the world and give this a try. And it's turned out pretty well. Uh, do you see this as temporary or long term? Well, we saw it as temporary at first, and I think it's certainly looking like it's turning long term. Our youngest daughter is both a US and a Finnish citizen because she was born here. and. and the older one is speaking both Swedish and English, so. major event was one that I had a direct hand in. I wrote a paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which was my observations, my anthropological analysis of what it was that made the open source world work. We didn't call it that then. We were still using the term free software primarily. So it was my observation of what made the free software world work and why we were able to produce extremely high quality software in spite of constantly violating all of the standard rules of software engineering. In that paper, I was setting up a contrast between two different styles of development, two opposed styles of development. One, which is the conventional closed development style, which I, I called the cathedral style. In that one, you have tight specification of objectives, um, small project groups which are run in a fairly hierarchical, authoritarian manner, uh, and you have long release intervals. On the other hand, what I ident identified as happening in the Linux world was a much more peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized market or bazaar-like style in which you have very short release intervals and constant solicitation of feedback from people who are formally outside the project, a very intense, intense peer review process. And the startling thing was that the more I looked at this, the more it seemed that trading away all the supposed advantages 
of conventional closed development for that one single advantage of massive independent peer review actually seems